Chapter 3 of Book 5 of Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Book 5th The Descent. Chapter 3 To Wit The Plan of Paris in 1727. Three hundred paces further on, he arrived at a point where the street forked. It separated into two streets which ran in a slanting line, one to the right and the other to the left. Jean Valjean had before him what resembled the two branches of a Y. Which should he choose? He did not hesitate, but took the one on the right. Why? Because that to the left ran towards a suburb, that is to say, towards inhabited regions, and the right branch towards the open country, that is to say, towards deserted regions. However, they no longer walked very fast. Cosette's pace retarded Jean Valjean's. He took her up and carried her again. Cosette laid her head on the shoulder of the good man and said not a word. He turned round from time to time and looked behind him. He took care to keep always on the dark side of the street. The street was straight in his rear. The first two or three times that he turned round he saw nothing. The silence was profound, and he continued his march somewhat reassured. All at once, on turning round, he thought he perceived in the portion of the street which he had just passed through, far off in the obscurity, something which was moving. He rushed forward precipitately rather than walked, hoping to find some side street to make his escape through it, and thus to break his scent once more. He arrived at a wall. This wall, however, did not absolutely prevent further progress. It was a wall which bordered a transverse street, in which the one he had taken ended. Here again he was obliged to come to a decision. Should he go to the right or to the left? He glanced to the right. The fragmentary lane was prolonged between buildings which were either sheds or barns, then ended at a blind alley. The extremity of the cul-de-sac was distinctly visible a lofty white wall. He glanced to the left. On that side the lane was open, and about two hundred paces further on ran into a street of which it was the affluent. On that side lay safety. At the moment when Jean Valjean was meditating a turn to the left, in an effort to reach the street which he saw at the end of the lane, he perceived a sort of motionless black statue at the corner of the lane and the street towards which he was on the point of directing his steps. It was someone, a man, who had evidently just been posted there, and who was barring the passage and waiting. Jean Valjean recoiled. The point of Paris where Jean Valjean found himself, situated between the Faubourg Saint-Antoine and La Rapie, is one of those which recent improvements have transformed from top to bottom resulting in disfigurement according to some, and in a transfiguration according to others. The market gardens, the timber yards, and the old buildings have been effaced. Today there are brand new wide streets, arenas, circuses, hippodromes, railway stations, and a prison, matzas, there, progress, as the reader sees, with its antidote. Half a century ago, in that ordinary popular tongue, which is all compounded of traditions, which persists in calling the Institut Les Quatre Nations and the Opera Comique Fait Dieu, the precise spot whither Jean Valjean had arrived was called Le Petit Picpus. The Port Saint-Jacques, the Port Paris, the Barrière de Sergence, the Porcherons, la Galiot, la Célestine, les Capuchines, la Merle, la Beurbe, la Abre de Cracovie, la Petite Pologne. These are the names of old Paris, which survive amid the new. The memory of the populace hovers over these relics of the past. La Petite Picpou, which, moreover, hardly ever had any existence, and never was more than the outline of a quarter, had nearly the monkish aspect of a Spanish town. The roads were not much paved, the streets were not much built up, with the exception of the two or three streets of which we shall presently speak, all was wall and solitude there. 
Not a shop, not a vehicle, hardly a candle lighted here and there in the windows. All lights extinguished after ten o'clock. Gardens, convents, timber yards, marshes, occasional lowly dwellings and great walls as high as the houses. Such was this quarter in the last century. The revolution snubbed it soundly. The Republican government demolished and cut through it. Rubbish chutes were established there. Thirty years ago this quarter was disappearing under the erasing process of new buildings. Today it has been utterly blotted out. The Petit Picpou, of which no existing plan has preserved a trace, is indicated with sufficient clearness in the plan of 1727. Published at Paris by Denis Thierry, Rue Saint-Jacques, opposite the Rue de Plâtre, at Lyons, by Jean Guirin, Rue Mercier, at the Sign of Prudence. Petit Picpou had, as we have just mentioned, a Y of streets, formed by the Rue Chemin Vert Saint Antoine, which spread out in two branches, taking on the left the name of Little Picpou Street, and on the right the name of the Rue Polentieu. These two limbs of the Y were connected at the apex as by a bar. This bar was called Rue Droimeur. The Rue Polentieu ended there. The Rue Petit Picpou passed on, and ascended towards the Lenoir Market. A person, coming from the scene, reached the extremity of the Rue Polentieu, and on his right, the Rue Droimeur, turning abruptly at a right angle, in front of him the wall of that street, and on his right a truncated prolongation of the Rue Droimeur, which had no issue and was called the Cul-de-Sac Genrot. It was here that Jean Valjean stood. As we have just said, on catching sight of that black silhouette standing on guard at the angle of the Rue Droimeur and the Rue Petit Picpou, he recoiled. There could be no doubt of it. That phantom was lying in wait for him. What was he to do? The time for retreating was past. That which he had perceived in movement an instant before, in the distant darkness, was Javert and his squad without a doubt. Javert was probably already at the commencement of the street, at whose end Jean Valjean stood. Javert, to all appearances, was acquainted with this little labyrinth, and had taken his precautions by sending one of his men to guard the exit. These surmises, which so closely resembled proofs, whirled suddenly, like a handful of dust caught up by an unexpected gust of wind, through Jean Valjean's mournful brain. He examined the cul-de-sac Genrot. There he was cut off. He examined the Rue Petit Picpou. There stood a sentinel. He saw that black form standing out in relief against the white pavement, illuminated by the moon. To advance was to fall into this man's hands. To retreat was to fling himself into Javert's arms. Jean Valjean felt himself caught, as in a net which was slowly contracting. He gazed heavenward in despair. End of Book 5 Chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Book 5 of Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book 5, Les Miserables Chapter 4, The Gropings of Flight in order to understand what follows, it is requisite to form an exact idea of the Droit Moor Lane, and in particular of the angle which one leaves on the left, when one emerges from the Rue Polonceau into this lane. Droit Moor Lane was almost entirely bordered on the right, as far as the Rue Petit Picpus, by houses of mean aspect, on the left by a solitary building of severe outlines composed of numerous parts which grew gradually higher by a story or two as they approached the Rue Petit Picpus side, so that this building which was very lofty on the Rue Petit Picpus side was tolerably low on the side adjoining the Rue Ponceau. There, at the angle of which we have spoken, it descended to such a degree that it consisted of merely a wall. This wall did not abut directly on the street. It formed a deeply retreating niche, 
concealed by its two corners from two observers who might have been one in the Rue Polonceau, the other in the Rue Trois Murs. Beginning with these angles of the niche, the wall extended along the Rue Polonceau as far as the house which bore the number 49 and along the Rue Trois Murs, where the fragment was much shorter, as far as the gloomy building which we have mentioned and whose gable it intersected, thus forming another retreating angle in the street. This gable was sombre of aspect, only one window was visible, or, to speak more correctly, two shutters covered with a sheet of zinc and kept constantly closed. The state of the places of which we are here giving a description is rigorously exact, and will certainly awake a very precise memory in the mind of old inhabitants of the quarter. The niche was entirely filled by a thing which resembled a colossal and wretched door. It was a vast formless assemblage of perpendicular planks, the upper ones being broader than the lower, bound together by long transverse strips of iron. At one side there was a carriage gate of the ordinary dimensions, and which had evidently not been cut more than fifty years previously. A linden tree showed its crest above the niche, and the wall was covered with ivy on the side of the Rue Polonceau. In the imminent peril in which Jean Valjean found himself, this sombre building had about it a solitary and uninhabited look which tempted him. He ran his eyes rapidly over it. He said to himself that if he could contrive to get inside it, he might save himself. First he conceived an idea, then a hope. In the central portion, of the front of this building on the Rue Droit Mur side, there were at all windows of the different stories ancient cistern pipes of lead, the various branches of the pipes which led from one central pipe to all these little basins, sketched out a sort of tree on the front. These ramifications of pipes with their hundred elbows imitated those old leafless vine stalks which writhe over the fronts of old farmhouses. This odd espalier, with its branches of lead and iron, was the first thing that struck Jean Valjean. He seated Cosette with her back against a stone post, with an injunction to be silent, and ran to the spot where the conduit touched the pavement. Perhaps there was some way of climbing up by it and entering the house, but the pipe was dilapidated and past service hardly hung to its fastenings. Moreover, all the windows of this silent dwelling were grated with heavy iron bars, even the attic window in the roof, and then the moon fell full upon that façade that the man who was watching at the corner of the street would have seen Jean Valjean in the act of climbing. And finally, what was to be done with Cosette? How was she to be drawn up to the top of the three-story house? He gave up all idea of climbing by means of the drain-pipe, and crawled along the wall to get back into the Rue Polonceau. When he reached the slant of the wall where he had left Cosette, he noticed that no one could see him there. As we have just explained, he was concealed from all eyes, no matter from which direction they were approaching. Besides this, he was in the shadow. Finally there were two doors, perhaps they might be forced the wall above which he saw the linden tree and the ivy evidently abutted on the garden where he could at least hide himself, although there were as yet no leaves on the trees, and spend the remainder of the night. Time was passing. He must act quickly. He felt over the carriage door and immediately recognized the fact that it was impractical outside and in. He approached the other door with more hope. It was frightfully decrepit. Its very immensity rendered it less solid. The planks were rotten. The iron bands, there were only three of them, were rusted. It seemed as though it might be possible to pierce this worm-eaten barrier. On examining it, he found that the door was not a door. 
It had neither hinges, crossbars, lock, nor fissure in the middle. The iron bands traversed it from side to side without any break. Through the crevices in the planks he caught a view of unhewn slabs and blocks of stone roughly cemented together, which passers-by might still have seen there ten years ago. He was forced to acknowledge with consternation that this apparent door was simply a wooden decoration of a building against which it was placed. It was easy to tear off a plank, but then one found one's self face to face with a wall. End of Book 5, Chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Book 5 of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood Book 5th, The Descent Chapter 5, Which Would Be Impossible With Gas Lanterns at that moment a heavy and measured sound began to be audible at some distance. Jean Valjean risked a glance round the corner of the street. Seven or eight soldiers, drawn up in a platoon, had just debouched into the Rue Polentieu. He saw the gleam of their bayonets. They were advancing towards him, these soldiers at whose head he distinguished Javert's tall figure advanced slowly and cautiously. They halted frequently. It was plain that they were searching all the nooks of the walls and all the embrasures of the doors and alleys. This was some patrol that Javert had encountered. There could be no mistake as to this surmise, and whose aid he had demanded. Javert's two acolytes were marching in their ranks. At the rate at which they were marching, and in consideration of the halts which they were making, it would take them about quarter of an hour to reach the spot where Jean Valjean stood. It was a frightful moment. A few minutes only separated Jean Valjean from that terrible precipice which yawned before him for the third time. And the galleys now meant not only the galleys, but Cosette lost to him for ever. That is to say, a life resembling the interior of a tomb. There was but one thing which was possible. Jean Valjean had this peculiarity, that he carried, as one might say, two beggar's pouches, in one he kept his saintly thoughts, in the other the redoubtable talents of a convict. He rummaged in the one or the other, according to circumstances. Among his other resources, thanks to his numerous escapes from the prison at Toulon, he was, as it will be remembered, a past master in the incredible art of crawling up without ladder or climbing irons, by sheer muscular force, by leaning on the nape of his neck, his shoulders, his hips and his knees, by helping himself on the rare projections of the stone, in the right angle of a wall, as high as the sixth story if need be, an art which has rendered so celebrated and so alarming that corner of the wall of the Conciergerie of Paris by which Batamol, condemned to death, made his escape twenty years ago. Jean Valjean measured with his eyes the wall above which he espied the linden, it was about eighteen feet in height. The angle which it formed with the gable of the large building was filled, at its lower extremity, by a mass of masonry of a triangular shape, probably intended to preserve that too convenient corner from the rubbish of those dirty creatures called the passers-by. This practice of filling up corners of the wall is much in use in Paris. This mass was about five feet in height. The space above the summit of this mass, which it was necessary to climb, was not more than fourteen feet. The wall was surmounted by a flat stone without a coping. Cosette was the difficulty, for she did not know how to climb a wall. Should he abandon her? Jean Valjean did not once think of that. It was impossible to carry her. A man's whole strength is required to successfully carry out these singular ascents. The least burden would disturb his centre of gravity and pull him downwards. A rope would have been required. Jean Valjean had none. Where was he to get a rope at midnight, in the Rue Polentieu? Certainly, if Jean Valjean had had a kingdom, he would have given it for a rope at that moment. All extreme situations have their lightning flashes which sometimes dazzle, sometimes illuminate us. 
Jean Valjean's despairing glance fell on the street lantern post of the blind alley Genrot. At that epoch there were no gas jets in the streets of Paris. At nightfall lanterns placed at regular distances were lighted. They were ascended and descended by means of a rope, which traversed the street from side to side, and was adjusted in a groove of the post. The pulley over which this rope ran was fastened underneath the lantern in a little iron box, the key to which was kept by the lamplighter, and the rope itself was protected by a metal case. Jean Valjean, with the energy of a supreme struggle, crossed the street at one bound, entered the blind alley, broke the latch of the little box with the point of his knife, and an instant later he was beside Cosette once more. He had a rope. These gloomy inventors of expedients work rapidly when they are fighting against fatality. We have already explained that the lanterns had not yet been lighted that night. The lantern in the cul-de-sac Genrot was thus naturally extinct, like the rest, and one could pass directly under it without even noticing that it was no longer in its place. Nevertheless, the hour, the place, the darkness, Jean Valjean's absorption, his singular gestures, his goings and comings, had all begun to render Cosette uneasy. Any other child than she would have given vent to loud shrieks long before. She contented herself with plucking Jean Valjean by the skirt of his coat. They could hear the sound of the patrol's approach ever more and more distinctly. Father, said she in a very low voice, I am afraid. Who is coming yonder? Hush, replied the unhappy man. It is Madame Thénardier. Cosette shuddered. He added, Say nothing. Don't interfere with me. If you cry out, if you weep, the Thénardier is lying in wait for you. She is coming to take you back. Then, without haste, but without making a useless movement, with firm and curt precision, the more remarkable at a moment when the patrol and Javert might come upon him at any moment, he undid his cravat, passed it round Cosette's body under the armpits, taking care that it should not hurt the child, fastened this cravat to one end of the rope, by means of that knot which seafaring men call a swallow knot, took the other end of the rope in his teeth, pulled off his shoes and stockings which he threw over the wall, stepped upon the mass of masonry, and began to raise himself in the angle of the wall and the gable, with as much solidity and certainty as though he had the rounds of a ladder under his feet and elbows. Half a minute had not elapsed when he was resting on his knees on the wall. Cosette gazed at him in stupid amazement, without uttering a word. Jean Valjean's injunction and the name of Madame Thénardier had chilled her blood. All at once she heard Jean Valjean's voice crying to her, though in a very low tone, Put your back against the wall. She obeyed. Don't say a word, and don't be alarmed, went on Jean Valjean. And she felt herself lifted from the ground. Before she had time to recover herself, she was on top of the wall. Jean Valjean grasped her, put her on his back, took her two tiny hands in his large left hand, lay down flat on his stomach and crawled along on the top of the wall as far as the cant. As he had guessed, there stood a building whose roof started from the top of the wooden barricade and ascended to within a very short distance of the ground, with a gentle slope which grazed the linden tree. A lucky circumstance, for the wall was much higher on this side than on the street side. Jean Valjean could only see the ground at a great depth below him. He had just reached the slope of the roof and had not yet left the crest of the wall when a violent uproar announced the arrival of the patrol. The thundering voice of Javert was audible. Search the blind alley. The Rue Dromeur is guarded. So is the Rue Petit Picpou. I'll answer for it that he is in the blind alley. The soldiers rushed in to the Genrot alley. Jean Valjean allowed himself to slide down the roof, still holding fast to Cosette, reached the linden tree, and leapt to the ground. Whether from terror or courage, Cosette had not breathed a sound, though her hands were a little abraded. End of Book 5, Chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Book 5 of Les Miserables, Volume 2 
by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 5. For a Black Hunt, a Mute Pack. Chapter 6. The Beginning of an Enigma. Jean Valjean found himself in a sort of garden which was very vast and of singular aspect. One of those melancholy gardens which seem made to be looked at in winter and at night. This garden was oblong in shape, with an alley of large poplars at the further end, tolerably tall forest trees in the corners, and an unshaded space in the center, where could be seen a very large solitary tree, then several fruit trees, gnarled and bristling like bushes, beds of vegetables, a melon patch, whose glass frames sparkled in the moonlight, and an old well. Here and there stood stone benches which seemed black with moss. The alleys were bordered with gloomy and very erect little shrubs. The grass had half taken possession of them, and a green mold covered the rest. Jean Valjean had beside him the building whose roof had served him as a means of descent, a pile of faggots, and behind the faggots, directly against the wall, a stone statue whose mutilated face was no longer anything more than a shapeless mask which loomed vaguely through the gloom. The building was a sort of ruin, where dismantled chambers were distinguishable, one of which, much encumbered, seemed to serve as a shed. The large building of the Rue Droit Mou, which had a wing on the Rue Petit Picpou, turned two façades at right angles, towards the garden. These interior façades were even more tragic than the exterior. All the windows were grated, not a gleam of light was visible at any one of them. The upper story had scuttles like prisons. One of those façades cast its shadow on the other, which fell over the garden like an immense black pall. No other house was visible. The bottom of the garden was lost in mist and darkness. Nevertheless, walls could be confusedly made out, which intersected as though they were more cultivated land beyond, and the low roofs of the Rue Polonceau. Nothing more wild and solitary than this garden could be imagined. There was no one in it, which was quite natural in view of the hour but it did not seem as though this spot were made for anyone to walk in, even in broad daylight. Jean Valjean's first care had been to get hold of his shoes and put them on again, then to step under the shed with Cosette. A man who is fleeing never thinks himself sufficiently hidden. The child, whose thoughts were still on the Thenardier, shared his instinct for withdrawing from sight as much as possible. Cosette trembled and pressed close to him. They heard the tumultuous noise of the patrols searching the blind alley and the streets, the blows of their gun stocks against the stones, Javert's appeals to the police spies whom he had posted, and his imprecations mingled with words which could not be distinguished. At the expiration of a quarter of an hour, it seemed as though that species of stormy roar were becoming more distant. Jean Valjean held his breath. He had laid his hand lightly on Cosette's mouth. However, the solitude in which he stood was so strangely calm that this frightful uproar, close and furious as it was, did not disturb him by so much as the shadow of a misgiving. It seemed as though those walls had been built of the deaf stones of which the scriptures speak. All at once, in the midst of this profound calm, a fresh sound arose, a sound as celestial, divine, ineffable, ravishing as the other had been horrible. It was a hymn which issued from the gloom, a dazzling burst of prayer and harmony in the obscure and alarming silence of the night. Women's voices, but voices composed at one and the same time of the pure accents of virgins and the innocent accents of children. Voices which are not of the earth and which resemble those that the newborn infant still hears and which the dying man hears already. The song proceeded from the gloomy edifice which towered above the garden. At the moment when the hubbub of demons retreated, one would have said that a choir of angels was approaching through the gloom. Cosette and Jean Valjean fell on their knees. They knew not what it was, they knew not where they were, but both of them, the man and the child, the penitent and the innocent, felt that they must kneel. These voices had this strange characteristic, that they did not prevent the building from seeming to be deserted. 
It was a supernatural chant in an uninhabited house. While these voices were singing, Jean Valjean thought of nothing. He no longer beheld the night. He beheld a blue sky. It seemed to him that he felt those wings which we all have within us, unfolding. The song died away. It may have lasted a long time. Jean Valjean could not have told. Hours of ecstasy are never more than a moment. All fell silent again. There was no longer anything in the street. There was nothing in the garden. That which had menaced, that which had reassured him, all had vanished. The breeze swayed a few dry weeds on the crest of the wall, and they gave out a faint, sweet, melancholy sound. End of Book 5, Chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Book 5 of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book Fifth For a Black Hunt, a Mute Pack Chapter Seven Continuation of the Enigma The night wind had risen, which indicated that it must be between one and two o'clock in the morning. Poor Cosette said nothing. As she had seated herself beside him and leaned her head against him, Jean Valjean had fancied that she was asleep. He bent down and looked at her. Cosette's eyes were wide open, and her thoughtful air pained Jean Valjean. She was still trembling. "'Are you sleepy?' said Jean Valjean. "'I am very cold,' she replied. A moment later she resumed, "'Is she still there?' "'Who?' said Jean Valjean. "'Madame Thenardier.' Jean Valjean had already forgotten the means which he had employed to make Cosette keep silent. "'Ah!' said he, "'she is gone. You need fear nothing further.' The child sighed as though a load had been lifted from her breast. The ground was damp, the shed open on all sides, the breeze grew more keen every instant. The good man took off his coat and wrapped it round Cosette. "'Are you less cold now?' said he. "'Oh, yes, father.' "'Well, wait for me a moment. I will soon be back.' He quitted the ruin and crept along the large building, seeking a better shelter. He came across doors, but they were closed. There were bars at all the windows of the ground floor. Just after he had turned the inner angle of the edifice, he observed that he was coming to some arched windows— where he perceived a light. He stood on tiptoe, and peeped through one of these windows. They all opened on a tolerably vast hall, paved with large flagstones, cut up by arcades and pillars, where only a tiny light and great shadows were visible. The light came from a taper which was burning in one corner. The apartment was deserted, and nothing was stirring in it, Nevertheless, by dint of gazing intently, he thought he perceived on the ground something which appeared to be covered with a winding-sheet, and which resembled a human form. This form was lying face downward, flat on the pavement, with the arms extended in the form of a cross, in the immobility of death. One would have said, judging from a sort of serpent which undulated over the floor, that this sinister form had a rope round its neck. The whole chamber was bathed in that mist of places which are sparely illuminated, which adds to horror. Jean Valjean often said afterwards that, although many funereal spectres had crossed his path in life, he had never beheld anything more blood-curdling and terrible than that enigmatical form accomplishing some inexplicable mystery in that gloomy place, and beheld thus at night. It was alarming to suppose that that thing was perhaps dead, and still more alarming to think that it was perhaps alive. He had the courage to plaster his face to the glass, and to watch whether the thing would move. 
In spite of his remaining thus what seemed to him a very long time, the outstretched form made no movement. All at once he felt himself overpowered by an inexpressible terror, and he fled. He began to run towards the shed, not daring to look behind him. It seemed to him that if he turned his head he should see that form following him with great strides and waving its arms. He reached the ruin all out of breath. His knees were giving way beneath him. The perspiration was pouring from him. Where was he? Who could ever have imagined anything like that sort of sepulchre in the midst of Paris? What was this strange house? an edifice full of nocturnal mystery, calling to souls through the darkness with the voice of angels, and when they came, offering them abruptly that terrible vision, promising to open the radiant portals of heaven, and then opening the horrible gates of the tomb. And it actually was an edifice, a house, which bore a number on the street, it was not a dream. He had to touch the stones to convince himself that such was the fact. Cold, anxiety, uneasiness, the emotions of the night, had given him a genuine fever, and all these ideas were clashing together in his brain. He stepped up to Cosette. She was asleep. End of Book Fifth, Chapter Seven Chapter 8 of Book 5 of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 5th, For a Black Hunt, a Mute Pack. Chapter 8, The Enigma Becomes Doubly Mysterious. The child had laid her head on a stone and fallen asleep. He sat down beside her and began to think. Little by little, as he gazed at her, he grew calm and regained possession of his freedom of mind. He clearly perceived this truth, the foundation of his life henceforth, that so long as she was there, so long as he had her near him, he should need nothing except for her. He should fear nothing except for her. He was not even conscious that he was very cold, since he had taken off his coat to cover her. Nevertheless, athwart this reverie into which he had fallen, he had heard for some time a peculiar noise. It was like the tinkling of a bell. This sound proceeded from the garden. It could be heard distinctly, though faintly. It resembled the faint, vague music produced by the bells of cattle at night in the pastures. This noise made Valjean turn round. He looked and saw that there was someone in the garden. A being resembling a man was walking amid the bell-glasses of the melon-beds, rising, stooping, halting, with regular movements, as though he were dragging or spreading out something on the ground. This person appeared to limp. Jean Valjean shuddered with the continual tremor of the unhappy. For them everything is hostile and suspicious. They distrust the day because it enables people to see them, and the night because it aids in surprising them. A little while before he had shivered because the garden was deserted, and now he shivered because there was someone there. He fell back from chimerical terrors to real terrors. He said to himself that Javert and the spies had, perhaps, not taken their departure, that they had, no doubt, left people on the watch in the street, that if this man should discover him in the garden, he would cry out for help against thieves and deliver him up. He took the sleeping Cosette gently in his arms, and carried her behind a heap of old furniture which was out of use in the most remote corner of the shed. Cosette did not stir. From that point 
he scrutinised the appearance of the being in the melon patch. The strange thing about it was that the sound of the bell followed each of this man's movements. When the man approached, the sound approached. When the man retreated, the sound retreated. If he made any hasty gesture, a tremolo accompanied the gesture. When he halted, the sound ceased. It appeared evident that the bell was attached to that man, but what could that signify? Who was this man who had a bell suspended about him like a ram or an ox? As he put these questions to himself, he touched Cosette's hands. They were icy cold. "'Ah, oh, good God!' he cried. He spoke to her in a low voice. "'Cosette!' She did not open her eyes. He shook her vigorously. She did not wake. "'Is she dead?' he said to himself, and sprang to his feet, quivering from head to foot. The most frightful thoughts rushed pell-mell through his mind. There are moments when hideous surmises assail us like a cohort of furies, and violently force the partitions of our brains. When those we love are in question, our prudence invents every sort of madness. He remembered that sleep in the open air on a cold night may be fatal. Cosette was pale, and had fallen at full length on the ground at his feet, without a movement. He listened to her breathing. She still breathed, but with a respiration which seemed to him weak and on the point of extinction. How was he to warm her back to life? How was he to rouse her? All that was not connected with this vanished from his thoughts. He rushed wildly from the ruin. It was absolutely necessary that Cosette should be in bed and beside a fire in less than a quarter of an hour. End of Book Fifth, Chapter Eight. Chapter Nine of Book Five of Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo. Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Five. For a Black Hunt, a Mute Pack. Chapter 9. The Man with the Bell. He walked straight up to the man whom he saw in the garden. He had taken in his hand the roll of silver which was in the pocket of his waistcoat. The man's head was bent down, and he did not see him approaching. In a few strides, Jean Valjean stood beside him. Jean Valjean accosted him with the cry. One hundred francs. The man gave a start and raised his eyes. You can earn a hundred francs, went on Jean Valjean, if you will grant me shelter for this night. The moon shone full upon Jean Valjean's terrified countenance. What? So it is you, Father Madeleine, said the man. That name, thus pronounced, at that obscure hour, in that unknown spot, by that strange man, made Jean Valjean start back. He had expected anything but that. The person who thus addressed him was a bent and lame old man, dressed almost like a peasant, who wore on his left knee a leather kneecap, whence hung a moderately large bell. His face, which was in the shadow, was not distinguishable. However, the good man had removed his cap, and exclaimed, trembling all over, "'Ah, good God!' How come you here, Father Madeleine? Where did you enter? Du Jésus, did you fall from heaven? There is no trouble about that. If ever you do fall, it will be from there. And what estates you are in? You have no cravat, you have no hat, you have no coat. Do you know you would have frightened anyone who did not know you? No coat, Lord God. Are the saints going mad nowadays? But how did you get in here? His words tumbled over each other. The good man talked with a rustic volubility, in which there was nothing alarming. All this was uttered with a mixture of stupefaction and naive kindliness. "'Who are you, and what house is this?' demanded Jean Valjean. "'Ah, pardieu, this is too much,' exclaimed the old man. "'I am the person for whom you got the place here, and this house is the one where you had me placed.' 
What? You don't recognize me? No, said Jean Valjean. And how happens it that you know me? You saved my life, said the man. He turned. A ray of moonlight outlined his profile, and Jean Valjean recognized old Fauchelevent. Ah, said Jean Valjean. So it is you. Yes, I recollect you. That is very lucky, said the old man in a reproachful tone. And what are you doing here? resumed Jean Valjean. Why, I am covering my melons, of course. In fact, at the moment when Jean Valjean accosted him, old Fauchelevent held in his hand the end of a straw mat which he was occupied in spreading over the melon bed. During the hour or thereabouts that he had been in the garden, he had already spread out a number of them. It was this operation which had caused him to execute the peculiar movements observed from the shed by Jean Valjean. He continued, I said to myself, the moon is bright, it is going to freeze. What if I were to put my melons into their greatcoats? And, he added, looking at Jean Valjean with a broad smile, Pardieu, you ought to have done the same, but how do you come here? Jean Valjean, finding himself known to this man, at least only under the name of Madeleine, thenceforth advanced only with caution. He multiplied his questions. Strange to say, their role seemed to be reversed. It was he, the intruder, who interrogated. And what is this bell which you wear on your knee? This, replied Fauchelevent, is so that I may be avoided. What? So that you may be avoided? Old Fauchelevent winked with an indescribable air. Ah, goodness, there are only women in this house, many young girls. It appears that I should be a dangerous person to meet. The bell gives them warning. When I come, they go. What house is this? Come, you know well enough. But I do not. Not when you got me the place here as gardener? Answer me as though I knew nothing. Well then, this is the Petit Pic Pew convent. Memories recurred to Jean Valjean. Chance, that is to say, Providence, had cast him into precisely that convent in the Quartier Saint Antoine, where old Fauchelevent, crippled by the fall from his cart, had been admitted on his recommendation two years previously. He repeated, as though talking to himself, The Petit Picpou Convent. Exactly, returned old Fauchelevent. But to come to the point, how the deuce did you manage to get in here, you, Father Madeleine? No matter if you are a saint, you are a man as well, and no man enters here. You certainly are here. There is no one but me. Still, said Jean Valjean, I must stay here. Ah, good God, cried Fauchelevent. Jean Valjean drew near to the old man, and said to him in a grave voice, Father Fauchelevent, I saved your life. I was the first to recall it, returned Fauchelevent. Well, you can do today for me that which I did for you in the olden days. Fauchelevent took in his aged, trembling, and wrinkled hands, Jean Valjean's two robust hands, and stood for several minutes as though incapable of speaking. At length he exclaimed, Oh, that would be a blessing from the good God, if I could make you some little return for that. Save your life. Monsieur le Maire, dispose of the old man. A wonderful joy had transfigured this old man. His countenance seemed to emit a ray of light. What do you wish me to do? He resumed. That I will explain to you. You have a chamber? I have an isolated hovel yonder, behind the ruins of the old convent, in a corner which no one ever looks into. There are three rooms in it. The hut was, in fact, so well hidden behind the ruins, and so cleverly arranged to prevent it being seen, that Jean Valjean had not perceived it. Good, said Jean Valjean. Now I am going to ask two things of you. What are they, Monsieur Mayer? In the first place, you are not to tell anyone what you know about me. In the second, you are not to try to find out anything more. As you please, I know that you can do nothing that is not honest, that you have always been a man after the good God's heart. And then, moreover, you it was who placed me here. That concerns you. I am at your service. 
But that is settled, then. Now, come with me. We will go and get the child. Ah, said Fauchelevon. So there is a child. He added not a word further, and followed Jean Valjean as a dog follows his master. Less than half an hour afterwards, Cosette, who had grown rosy again before the flame of a good fire, was lying asleep in the old gardener's bed. Jean Valjean had put on his cravat and coat once more. His hat, which he had flung over the wall, had been found and picked up. While Jean Valjean was putting on his coat, Fauchelevent had removed the bell the kneecap, which now hung on a nail beside a vintage basket that adorned the wall. The two men were warming themselves, with their elbows resting on a table, upon which Fauchelevent had placed a bit of cheese, black bread, a bottle of wine, and two glasses. And the old man was saying to Jean Valjean, as he laid his hand on the latter's knee, Ah, Father Madeleine, you did not recognize me immediately. You save people's lives, and then you forget them. That is bad. But they remember you. You are an ingrate. End of Book 5, Chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Book 5 of Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book 5th, For a Black Hunt, A Mute Pack Chapter 10, which explains how Javert got on the scent The events of which we have just beheld the reverse side, so to speak, had come about in the simplest possible manner. When Jean Valjean, on the evening of the very day when Javert had arrested him beside Fantine's deathbed, had escaped from the town jail of M. sur M., the police had supposed that he had betaken himself to Paris. Paris is a maelstrom where everything is lost, and everything disappears in this belly of the world, as in the belly of the sea. No forest hides a man as does that crowd. Fugitives of every sort know this. They go to Paris as to an abyss. There are gulfs which save. The police know it also, and it is in Paris that they seek what they have lost elsewhere. They sought the ex-mayor of M. sur M., Javert was summoned to Paris to throw light on their researches. Javert had, in fact, rendered powerful assistance in the recapture of Jean Valjean. Javert's zeal and intelligence on that occasion had been remarked by Monsieur Chabouillet, secretary of the prefecture under Comte Anglis. Monsieur Chabouillet, who had, moreover, already been Javert's patron, had the inspector of M. sur M. attached to the police force of Paris. There Javert rendered himself useful in divers, and, though the word may seem strange for such services, honorable manners. He no longer thought of Jean Valjean. The wolf of today causes those dogs who are always on the chase to forget the wolf of yesterday. When, in December 1823, he read a newspaper, he who never read newspapers, but Javert, a monarchical man, had a desire to know the particulars of the triumphal entry of the Prince Generalissimo into Bayonne. Just as he was finishing the article, which interested him, a name, the name of Jean Valjean, attracted his attention at the bottom of a page. The paper announced that the convict Jean Valjean was dead, and published the fact in such formal terms that Javert did not doubt it. He confined himself to the remark, That's a good entry. Then he threw aside the paper and thought no more about it. Some time afterward, it chanced that a police report was transmitted from the prefecture of the saint Etoile to the prefecture of police in Paris, concerning the abduction of a child, which had taken place, under peculiar circumstances, as it was said, in the commune of Montfermeil. A little girl of seven or eight years of age, the report said, who had been entrusted by her mother to an innkeeper of that neighborhood, had been stolen by a stranger. This child answered to the name of Cosette, and was the daughter of a girl named Fantine, who had died in the hospital, it was not known where or when. This report came under Javert's eye, and set him to thinking. The name of Fantine was well known to him. He remembered that Jean Valjean had made him, Javert, burst into laughter by asking him for a respite of three days, for the purpose of going to fetch that creature's child. He recalled the fact that Jean Valjean had been arrested in Paris, at the very moment when he was stepping into the coach for Montfermeil. Some signs had made him suspect at the time that this was the second occasion of his entering that coach, and that he had already, on the previous day, made an excursion to the neighborhood of that village, for he had not been seen in the village itself. 
What had he been intending to do in that region of Montfermeil? It could not even be surmised. Javert understood it now. Fantine's daughter was there. Jean Valjean was going there in search of her. And now this child had been stolen by a stranger. Who could that stranger be? Could it be Jean Valjean? But Jean Valjean was dead. Javert, without saying anything to anybody, took the coach from the pewter platter, cul-de-sac de la planche, and made a trip to Montfermeil. He expected to find a great deal of light on the subject there. He expected to find a great deal of light on the subject there. He found a great deal of obscurity. For the first few days, the Thernardiers had chattered in their rage. The disappearance of the Lark had created a sensation in the village. He immediately obtained numerous versions of the story, which ended in the abduction of a child, hence the police report. But their first vexation having passed off, Thernardier, with his wonderful instinct, had very quickly comprehended that it is never advisable to stir up the prosecutor of the crown, and that his complaints with regard to the abduction of Cassette would have as their first result to fix upon himself, and upon many dark affairs which he had on hand, the glittering eye of justice. The last thing that owls desire is to have a candle brought to them. And in the first place, how explain the fifteen hundred francs which he had received? He turned squarely round, put a gag on his wife's mouth, and feigned astonishment when the stolen child was mentioned to him. He understood nothing about it. No doubt he had grumbled for a while at having that dear little creature taken from him so hastily. He should have liked to keep her two or three days longer, out of tenderness. But her grandfather had come for her in the most natural way in the world. He added the grandfather, which produced a good effect. This was the story that Javert hit upon when he arrived at Montfermeil. The grandfather caused Jean Valjean to vanish. Nevertheless, Javert dropped a few questions, like plummets, into Thernardier's history. Who was that grandfather, and what was his name? Thernardier replied with simplicity. He is a wealthy farmer. I saw his passport. I think his name was uh, Monsieur Gilliam Lambert. Lambert is a respectable and extremely reassuring name. Thereupon Javert returned to Paris. Jean Valjean is certainly dead, said he, and I am a ninny. He had again begun to forget this history when, in the course of March, 1824, he heard of a singular personage who dwelt in the parish of St. Medard, and who had been surnamed the Mendicant Who Gives Alms. This person, the story ran, was a man of means, whose name no one knew exactly, and who lived alone with a little girl of eight years, who knew nothing about herself, save that she had come from Montfermeil. Montfermeil! That name was always coming up, and it made Javert prick up his ears. An old beggar police spy, an ex-beadle to whom this person had given alms, added a few more details. This gentleman of property was very shy, never coming out except in the evening, speaking to no one, except occasionally to the poor, and never allowing anyone to approach him. He wore a horrible old yellow frock coat, which was worth many millions, being all wadded up with bank bills. This piqued Javert's curiosity in a decided manner. In order to get a close look at this fantastic gentleman without alarming him, he borrowed the beadle's outfit for a day, and the place where the old spy was in the habit of crouching every evening, whining orisons through his nose, and playing the spy under cover of prayer. The suspected individual did indeed approach Javert thus disguised, and bestow alms on him. At that moment Javert raised his head, and the shock which Jean Valjean received on recognizing Javert was equal to the one received by Javert when he thought he recognized Jean Valjean. However, the darkness might have misled him. Jean Valjean's death was official. Javert cherished very grave doubts, and when in doubt, Javert, the man of scruples, never laid a finger on anyone's collar. He followed his man to the Gorbeau house and got the old woman to talking, which was no difficult matter. The old woman confirmed the fact regarding the coat lined with millions, and narrated to him the episode of the thousand-franc bill. She had seen it. She had handled it. Javert hired a room. That evening he installed himself in it. He came and listened at the mysterious lodger's door, hoping to catch the sound of his voice. But Jean Valjean saw his candle through the keyhole, and foiled the spy by keeping silent. On the following day Jean Valjean decamped, but the noise made by the fall of the five-franc piece was noticed by the old woman, who, hearing the rattling of coin, suspected that he might be intending to leave, and made haste to warn Javert. 
At night, when Jean Valjean came out, Javert was waiting for him behind the trees of the boulevard with two men. Javert had demanded assistance at the prefecture, but he had not mentioned the name of the individual whom he hoped to seize. That was his secret, and he had kept it for three reasons. In the first place, because the slightest indiscretion might put Jean Valjean on the alert. Next, because to lay hands on an ex-convict who had made his escape and was reputed dead, on a criminal whom justice had formerly classed forever as among malefactors of the most dangerous sort, was a magnificent success, which the old members of the Parisian police would assuredly not leave to a newcomer like Javert, and he was afraid of being deprived of his convict. And lastly, because Javert, being an artist, had a taste for the unforeseen, he hated those well-heralded successes which are talked of long in advance, and have the bloom brushed off. He preferred to elaborate his masterpieces in the dark, and to unveil them suddenly at the last. Javert had followed Jean Valjean from tree to tree, then from corner to corner of the street, and had not lost sight of him for a single instant. Even at the moments when Jean Valjean believed himself to be the most secure, Javert's eye had been on him. Why had not Javert arrested Jean Valjean? Because he was still in doubt. It must be remembered that at the epoch the police was not precisely at its ease. The free press embarrassed it. Several arbitrary arrests denounced by the newspapers had echoed even as far as the chambers, and had rendered the prefecture timid. Interference with individual liberty was a grave matter. The police agents were afraid of making a mistake. The prefect laid the blame on them. A mistake meant dismissal. The reader can imagine the effect which this brief paragraph, reproduced by twenty newspapers, would have caused in Paris. Yesterday, an aged grandfather, with white hair, a respectable and well-to-do gentleman, who was walking with his grandchild, aged eight, was arrested and conducted to the agency of the prefecture, as an escaped convict. Let us repeat in addition that Javert had scruples of his own. Injunctions of his conscience were added to the injunctions of the prefect. He was really in doubt. Jean Valjean turned his back on him and walked in the dark. Sadness, uneasiness, anxiety, depression. This fresh misfortune of being forced to flee by night, to seek a chance refuge in Paris for Cassette and himself, the necessity of regulating his pace to the pace of the child. All this, without his being aware of it, had altered Jean Valjean's walk and impressed on his bearing such senility that the police themselves, incarnate in the person of Javert, might and did in fact make a mistake. The impossibility of approaching too close, his costume of an émigré preceptor, the declaration of Thernardier which made a grandfather of him, and finally, the belief in his death in prison, added still further to the uncertainty which gathered thick in Javert's mind. For an instant it occurred to him to make an abrupt demand for his papers, but if the man was not Jean Valjean, and if this man was not a good, honest old fellow living on his income, he was probably some merry blade deeply and cunningly implicated in the obscure web of Parisian misdeeds, some chief of a dangerous band who gave alms to conceal his other talents, which was an old dodge. He had trusty fellows, accomplices retreats in case of emergencies, in which he would, no doubt, take refuge. All these turns which he was making through the streets seemed to indicate that he was not a simple and honest man. To arrest him too hastily would be to kill the hen that laid the golden eggs. Where was the inconvenience in waiting? Javert was very sure that he would not escape. Thus he proceeded in a tolerably perplexed state of mind, putting to himself a hundred questions about this enigmatical personage. It was only quite late in the Rue de Pontois that, thanks to the brilliant light thrown from a dram shop, he decidedly recognized Jean Valjean. There are in this world two beings who give a profound start, the mother who recovers her child, and the tiger who recovers his prey. Javert gave that profound start. As soon as he had positively recognized Jean Valjean, the formidable convict, he perceived that there were only three of them, and he asked for reinforcements at the police station of the Rue de Pontois. One puts on gloves before grasping a thorn cudgel. This delay, and the halt at the Carrefour Roland to consult with his agents, came near causing him to lose the trail. He speedily divined, however, that Jean Valjean would want to put the river between his pursuers and himself. He bent his head and reflected like a bloodhound who puts his nose to the ground to make sure that he is on the right scent. Javert, with his powerful rectitude of instinct, went straight to the bridge of Austerlitz. 
A word with the toll keeper furnished him with the information which he required. Have you seen a man with a little girl? I made him pay two sous, replied the toll keeper. Javert reached the bridge in season to see Jean Valjean traverse the small, illuminated spot on the other side of the water, leading Cassette by the hand. He saw him enter the Rue de Chemin vers Saint Antoine. He remembered the cul de sac genre arranged there like a trap, and of the sole exit of the Rue Drumour into the Rue Petit Pispus. He made sure of his back burrows, as huntsmen say. He hastily dispatched one of his agents, by a roundabout way, to guard that issue. A patrol which was returning to the arsenal post having passed him, he made a requisition on it, and caused it to accompany him. In such games soldiers are aces. Moreover, the principle is, that in order to get the best of a wild boar, one must employ the science of venery, and plenty of dogs. These combinations having been effected, feeling that Jean Valjean was caught between the blind alley Jean Roux on the right, his agents on the left, and himself Javert in the rear, he took a pinch of snuff. Then he began the game. He experienced one ecstatic and infernal moment. He allowed his man to go on ahead, knowing that he had him safe but desirous of postponing the moment of arrest as long as possible, happy at the thought that he was taken, and yet at seeing him free, gloating over him with his gaze, with that voluptuousness of the spider which allows the fly to flutter, and of the cat which lets the mouse run. Claws and talons possess a monstrous sensuality. The obscure movements of the creature imprisoned in their pincers. What a delight this strangling is! Javert was enjoying himself. The meshes of his net were stoutly knotted. He was sure of success. All he had to do now was close his hand. Accompanied as he was, the very idea of resistance was impossible, however vigorous, energetic, and desperate Jean Valjean might be. Javert advanced slowly, sounding, searching on his way all the nooks of the street like so many pockets of thieves. When he reached the center of the web, he found the fly no longer there. His exasperation can be imagined. He interrogated his sentinel of the Rue Droimour and Petit Pispus. That agent, who had remained imperturbably at his post, had not seen the man pass. It sometimes happens that a stag is lost head and horns. That is to say, he escapes, although he has the pack on his very heels. And then the oldest huntsmen know not what to say. Duvivier, Lenneville, and Desprez halt short. In a discomfiture of this sort, Artong exclaims, It was not a stag, but a sorcerer. Javert would have liked to utter the same cry. His disappointment bordered for a moment on despair and rage. It is certain that Napoleon made mistakes during the war with Russia, that Alexander committed blunders in the war in India, that Caesar made mistakes in the war in Africa, that Cyrus was at fault in the war in Scythia, and that Javert blundered in this campaign against Jean Valjean. He was wrong, perhaps, in hesitating in his recognition of the ex-convict. The first glance should have sufficed him. He was wrong in not arresting him purely and simply in the old building. He was wrong in not arresting him when he had positively recognized him in the Rue de Pontois. He was wrong in taking counsel with his auxiliaries in the full light of the moon at the Carrefour Roland. Advice is certainly useful. It is a good thing to know and to interrogate those of the dogs who deserve confidence. But the hunter cannot be too cautious when he is chasing uneasy animals, like the wolf and the convict. Javert, by taking too much thought as to how he should set the bloodhounds of the pack on the trail, alarmed the beast by giving him wind of the dart, and so made him run. Above all, he was wrong in that after he had picked up the scent again on the bridge of Austerlitz, he played that formidable and puerile game of keeping such a man at the end of a thread. He thought himself stronger than he was, and believed that he could play at the game of the mouse and the lion. At the same time, he reckoned himself as too weak when he judged it necessary to obtain reinforcement. Fatal precaution, waste of precious time. Javert committed all these blunders, and nonetheless was one of the cleverest and most correct spies that ever existed. He was, in full force of the term, what is called in venery, a knowing dog. But what is there that is perfect? Great strategists have their eclipses. The greatest follies are often composed, like the largest ropes, of a multitude of strands. Take the cable thread by thread, take all the petty determining motives separately, and you can break them one after the other, and you say, that is all there is of it. Braid them, twist them together, 
The result is enormous. It is Attila hesitating between Marcion on the east and Valentinian on the west. It is Hannibal tarrying at Capua. It is Danton falling asleep at Arsis Araub. However that may be, even at the moment when he saw that Jean Valjean had escaped him, Javert did not lose his head. Sure that the convict who had broken his band could not be far off, he established sentinels, he organized traps and ambuscades, and beat the quarter all that night. The first thing he saw was the disorder in the street lantern whose rope had been cut, a precious sign which, however, led him astray, since it caused him to turn all his researches in the direction of the cul-de-sac genre. In this blind alley there were tolerably low walls, which abutted on gardens whose bounds adjoined the immense stretches of wasteland. Jean Valjean evidently must have fled in that direction. The fact is, that had he penetrated a little further in the cul-de-sac genre, he would probably have done so and have been lost. Javert explored these gardens and these waste stretches as though he had been hunting for a needle. At daybreak he left two intelligent men on the lookout and returned to the prefecture of police, as much ashamed as a police spy who had been captured by a robber might have been. End of Book 5 Chapter 10 Chapter 1 of Book 6 of Les Miserables, Volume 2 by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book 6, Le Petit Pispieux Chapter 1, Number 62, Rue Petit Pispieux Nothing, half a century ago, more resembled every other carriage gate than the carriage gate of Number 62, Rue Petit Pispieux. This entrance, which usually stood ajar in the most inviting fashion, permitted a view of two things, neither of which have anything very funereal about them. A courtyard surrounded by walls hung with vines, and the face of a lounging porter. Above the wall, at the bottom of the court, tall trees were visible. When a ray of sunlight enlivened the courtyard, when a glass of wine cheered up the porter, it was difficult to pass number 62 Little Pispius Street without carrying away a smiling impression of it. Nevertheless, it was a somber place of which one had had a glimpse. The threshold smiled. The house prayed and wept. If one succeeded in passing the porter, which was not easy, which was even nearly impossible for everyone, for there was an open sesame which it was necessary to know, if the porter once passed, one entered a little vestibule on the right, on which opened a staircase, shut in between two walls and so narrow that only one person could ascend it at a time, if one did not allow oneself to be alarmed by a daubing of canary yellow with a dado of chocolate which clothed this staircase, if one ventured to ascend it, one crossed a first landing, then a second, and arrived on the first story at a corridor where the yellow wash and the chocolate-hued plinth pursued one with a peaceable persistency. Staircase and corridor were lighted by two beautiful windows. The corridor took a turn and became dark. If one doubled this cape, one arrived a few paces further on, in front of a door which was all the more mysterious, because it was not fastened. If one opened it, one found oneself in a little chamber about six feet square, tiled, well scrubbed, clean, cold, and hung with nankin paper with green flowers, at fifteen sous the roll. A white, dull light fell from a large window, with tiny panes on the left, which usurped the whole width of the room. One gazed about but saw no one. One listened. One heard neither a footstep nor a human murmur. The walls were bare. The chamber was not furnished. There was not even a chair. One looked again and beheld on the wall facing the door a quadrangular hole, about a foot square, with a grating of interlacing iron bars, black, knotted, solid, which formed squares, I had almost said meshes, of less than an inch and a half in diagonal length. The little green flowers of a nankin paper ran in a calm and orderly manner to those iron bars, without being startled or thrown into confusion by their funereal contact. Supposing that a living thing had been so wonderfully thin as to essay an entrance or an exit through the square hole, this grating would have prevented it. It did not allow the passage of the body, but it did allow the passage of the eyes, that is to say, of the mind. This seems to have occurred to them, 
where it had been reinforced by a sheet of tin inserted in the wall a little in the rear, and pierced with a thousand holes more microscopic than the holes of a strainer. At the bottom of this plate, an aperture had been pierced exactly similar to the orifice of a letterbox. A bit of tape attached to a bell wire hung at the right of the grated opening. If the tape was pulled, a bell rang, and one heard a voice very near at hand, which made one start. Who is there? the voice demanded. It was a woman's voice, a gentle voice, so gentle that it was mournful. Here, again, there was a magical word which it was necessary to know. If one did not know it, the voice ceased, the wall became silent once more, as though the terrified obscurity of the sepulchre had been on the other side of it. If one knew the password, the voice resumed, Enter on the right. One then perceived on the right, facing the window, a glass door surmounted by a frame glazed and painted grey. On raising the latch and crossing the threshold, one experienced precisely the same impression as when one enters at the theatre into a grated bachinois, before the grating is lowered and the chandelier is lighted. One was, in fact, in a sort of theatre box, narrow, furnished with two old chairs and a much frayed straw matting, sparely illuminated by the vague light from the glass door, a regular box, with its front just of a height to lean upon bearing a tablet of black wood. This box was grated, only the grating of it was not of gilded wood, as at the opera. It was a monstrous lattice of iron bars, hideously interlaced and riveted to the wall by enormous fastenings, which resembled clenched fists. The first minutes passed. When one's eyes began to grow used to this cellar-like half-twilight, one tried to pass the grating, but got no further than six inches beyond it. There he encountered a barrier of black shutters, reinforced and fortified with transverse beams of wood painted a gingerbread yellow. These shutters were divided into long, narrow slats, and they masked the entire length of the grating. They were always closed. At the expiration of a few moments one heard a voice proceeding from behind these shutters, and saying, I am here. What do you wish with me? It was a beloved, sometimes an adored voice. No one was visible. Hardly the sound of a breath was audible. It seemed as though it were a spirit which had been evoked, that was speaking to you across the walls of the tomb. If one chanced to be within certain prescribed and very rare conditions, the slat of one of the shutters opened opposite you. The evoked spirit became an apparition. Behind the grating, behind the shutter, one perceived, so far as the grating permitted sight, a head, of which only the mouth and the chin were visible. The rest was covered with a black veil. One caught a glimpse of a black gimp, and a form that was barely defined, covered with a black shroud. That head spoke with you, but did not look at you and never smiled at you. The light which came from behind you was adjusted in such a manner that you saw her in the white, and she saw you in the black. This light was symbolical. Nevertheless, your eyes plunged eagerly through that opening which was made in that place shut off from all glances. A profound vagueness enveloped that form clad in mourning. Your eyes searched that vagueness and sought to make out the surroundings of the apparition. At the expiration of a very short time, you discovered that you could see nothing. What you beheld was night, emptiness, shadows. A wintry mist mingled with a vapor from the tomb, a sort of terrible peace, a silence from which you could gather nothing, not even sighs, a gloom in which you could distinguish nothing, not even phantoms. What you beheld was the interior of a cloister. It was the interior of that severe and gloomy edifice which was called the convent of the Bernardines of the Perpetual Adoration. The box in which you stood was the parlor. The first voice which had addressed you was that of the portress, who always sat motionless and silent, on the other side of the wall, near the square opening, screened by the iron grating, and the plate with its thousand holes, as by a double visor. The obscurity which bathed the grated box arose from the fact that the parlor, which had a window on the side of the world, 
had none on the side of the convent. Profane eyes must see nothing of that sacred place. Nevertheless, there was something beyond that shadow. There was a light. There was life in the midst of that death. Although this was the most strictly walled of all convents, we shall endeavor to make our way into it, and to take the reader in, and to say, without transgressing proper bounds, things which storytellers have never seen, and have, therefore, never described. End of Book Six, Chapter One. Chapter Two of Book Six of Les Miserables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Six, Le Petit Picpus, Chapter Two, The Obedience of Martin Verga. This convent which in 1824 had already existed for many a long year in the Rue Petit Picpus, was a community of Bernardines in the obedience of Martin Verga. These Bernardines were attached, in consequence, not to Clairvaux, like the Bernardine monks, but to Citeaux, like the Benedictine monks. In other words, they were the subjects not of Saint Bernard, but of Saint Benoit. Anyone who has turned over old folios to any extent knows that Martin Verga founded in 1425 a congregation of Bernardines Benedictines, with Salamanca for the head of the order, and Alcala as the branch establishment. This congregation had sent out branches throughout all the Catholic countries of Europe. There is nothing unusual in the Latin Church in these grafts of one order on another. To mention only a single order of St. Benoit, which is here in question, there are attached to this order, without counting the obedience of Martin Verga, four congregations, two in Italy, Montcassin and St. Justine of Padua, two in France, Cluny and St. Maur, and nine orders, Valombrosa, Gramont, the Celestins, the Camadules, the Carthusians, the Humilies, the Oliveters, the Silvestrans, and lastly, Citeaux. For Citeaux itself, a trunk for other orders, is only an offshoot of saint Benoit. Citeaux dates from Saint-Robert, Abbé de Molesme, in the Diocese of Langres, in 1098. Now it was in 529 that the devil, having retired to the desert of Subiaco, he was old, had he turned hermit, was chased from the ancient temple of Apollo, where he dwelt, by Saint Benoit, then aged seventeen. After the rule of the Carmelites, who go barefoot, wear a bit of willow on their throats, and never sit down, the harshest rule is that of the Bernardine Benedictines, of Martin Verga. They are clothed in black, with a gimp, which, in accordance to the express command of Saint Benoit, mounts to the chin, a robe of serge with large sleeves, a woolen veil, the gimp which mounts to the chin cut square on the breast, the band which descends over their brow to their eyes, this is their dress. All is black except the band, which is white. The novices wear the same habit, but all in white. The professed nuns also wear a rosary at their side. The Bernardine Benedictines of Martin Verga practice the perpetual adoration, like the Benedictines called Ladies of the Holy Sacrament, who at the beginning of this century had two houses in Paris, one at the temple, the other in the Rue Neuve Saint Genevieve. However, the Bernardine Benedictines of the Petit Picpus, of whom we are speaking, were a totally different order from the Ladies of the Holy Sacrament cloistered in the ruin of St. Genevieve and at the temple. There were numerous differences in their rule. There were some in their costume. The Bernardine Benedictine of the Petit Picpus wore the black gimp, and the Benedictine of the Holy Sacrament and of the ruin of St. Genevieve wore a white one, and had, besides, on their breasts a holy sacrament about three inches long, in silver gilt or gilded copper. The nuns of the Petit Picpus did not wear this holy sacrament. The perpetual adoration, which was common to the house of the Petit Picpus, 
and to the house of the temple, leaves those two orders perfectly distinct. Their only resemblance lies in this practice of the ladies of the Holy Sacrament and the Bernardines of Martin Verga, just as there existed a similarity in the study and the glorification of all the mysteries relating to the infancy, the life, and the death of Jesus Christ and the Virgin between the two orders, which were, nevertheless, widely separated, and on occasion even hostile. The Oratory of Italy, established at Florence by Philip de Neri, and the Oratory of France, established by Pierre de Berrou. The Oratory of France claimed the precedence, since Philip de Neri was only a saint, while Berrou was a cardinal. Let us return to the harsh Spanish rule of Martin Verga. The Bernardine Benedictines of this obedience fast all the year round, abstain from meat, fast in Lent and on many other days which are peculiar to them, rise from their first sleep from one to three o'clock in the morning to read their breviary and to chant matins, sleep in all seasons between serge sheets and on straw, make no use of the bath, never light a fire, scourge themselves every Friday, observe the rule of silence, speak to each other only during the recreation hours, which are very brief, and wear drugget chemises for six months in the year, from September 14th, which is the exaltation of the Holy Cross, until Easter. These six months are a modification. The rule says all the year, but this drugget chemise, intolerable in the heat of summer, produced fevers and nervous spasms. The use of it had to be restricted. Even with this palliation, when the nuns put on this chemise on the 14th of September, they suffer from fever for three or four days. Obedience, poverty, chastity, perseverance in their seclusion, these are their vows, which the rule greatly aggravates. The prioress is elected for three years by the mothers, who are called mere vocal because they have a voice in the chapter. A prioress can only be re-elected twice, which fixes the longest possible reign of a prioress at nine years. They never see the officiating priest, who is always hidden from them by a serge curtain nine feet in height. During the sermon, when the preacher is in the chapel, they drop their veils over their faces. They must always speak low, walk with their eyes on the ground and their heads bowed. One man only is allowed to enter the convent, the archbishop of the diocese. There is really one other, the gardener, but he is always an old man and in order that he may always be alone in the garden, and that the nuns may be warned to avoid him, a bell is attached to his knee. Their submission to the prioress is absolute and passive. It is the canonical subjection in the full force of its abnegation. As at the voice of Christ, ut voci Christi, at a gesture, at the first sign, ad nutum, ad primum signum, immediately, with cheerfulness, with perseverance, with a certain blind obedience, prompte, hilariter, perseveranter, et ceca quadam obedientia, as in the file in the hand of the workman, quasi limam in manibus fabri, without power to read or to write, without express permission, legere vel scribere, non arisgerit sine expressa superioris licentia. Each one of them in turn makes what they call reparation. The reparation is the prayer for all the sins, for all the faults, for all the dissensions, for all the violations, for all the iniquities, for all the crimes committed on earth. For the space of twelve consecutive hours, from four o'clock in the afternoon till four o'clock in the morning, or from four o'clock in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon, the sister who is making reparation remains on her knees on the stone before the Holy Sacrament, with hands clasped, a rope around her neck. When her fatigue becomes unendurable, she prostrates herself flat on her face against the earth with her arms outstretched in the form of a cross. This is her only relief. In this attitude she prays for all the guilty in the universe, this is great to sublimity. 
As this act is performed in front of a post on which burns a candle, it is called without distinction to make reparation or to be at the post. The nuns even prefer, out of humility, this last expression, which contains an idea of torture and abasement. To make reparation is a function in which the whole soul is absorbed. The sister at the post would not turn round were a thunderbolt to fall directly behind her. Besides this, there is always a sister kneeling before the Holy Sacrament. This station lasts an hour. They relieve each other like soldiers on guard. This is the perpetual adoration. The prioresses and the mothers almost always bear names stamped with peculiar solemnity, recalling not the saints and martyrs, but moments in the life of Jesus Christ, as Mother Nativity, Mother Conception, Mother Presentation, Mother Passion. But the names of saints are not interdicted. When one sees them, one never sees anything but their mouths. All their teeth are yellow. No toothbrush ever entered that convent. Brushing one's teeth is at the top of a ladder at whose bottom is the loss of one's soul. They never say, my. They possess nothing of their own, and they must not attach themselves to anything. They call everything our, thus, our veil, our chaplet. If they were speaking of their chemise, they would say our chemise. Sometimes they grow attached to some petty object, to a book of hours, a relic, a medal that has been blessed. As soon as they become aware that they are growing attached to this object, they must give it up. They recall the words of St. Therese, to whom a great lady said, and she was on the point of entering her order, Permit me, mother, to send for a Bible to which I am greatly attached. Ah, you are attached to something. In that case, do not enter our order. Every person whatever is forbidden to shut herself up, to have a place of her own, a chamber. They live with their cells open. When they meet, one says, Blessed and adored be the most holy sacrament of the altar. The other responds, Forever. The same ceremony when one taps at the other's door. Hardly has she touched the door when a soft voice on the other side is heard to say hastily, Forever. Like all practices, this becomes mechanical by force of habit, and one sometimes says forever before the other has had time to say the rather long sentence, Praised and adored be the most holy sacrament of the altar. Among the visitandines, the one who enters says Ave Maria, and the one whose cell is entered says Gratia Plena. It is their way of saying good day, which is in fact full of grace. At each hour of the day three supplementary strokes sound from the church bell of the convent. At this signal, prioress, vocal mothers, professed nuns, lay sisters, novices, postulants, interrupt what they are saying, what they are doing, or what they are thinking, and all say in unison if it is five o'clock, for instance, At five o'clock and at all hours, praised and adored be the most holy sacrament of the altar. If it is eight o'clock, at eight o'clock and at all hours, and so on, according to the hour. This custom, the object of which is to break the thread of thought and to lead it back constantly to God, exists in many communities. The formula alone varies. Thus, at the infant Jesus, they say, at this hour and at every hour may the love of Jesus kindle my heart. The Bernardine Benedictines of Martin Verga cloistered fifty years ago at Petit Picpu, chant the offices to a solemn psalmody, a pure Gregorian chant, and always with full voice during the whole course of the office. Everywhere in the missal where an asterisk occurs, they pause and say in a low voice, Jésus Marie Joseph. For the office of the dead, they adopt a tone so low that the voices of women can hardly descend to such a depth. The effect produced is striking and tragic. The nuns of the Petit Picpu had made a vault under their grand altar for the burial of their community. The government, as they say, does not permit this vault to receive coffins, 
so they leave the convent when they die. This is an affliction to them, and it causes them consternation as an infraction of the rules. They had obtained a mediocre consolation at best, permission to be interred at a special hour and in a special corner, in the ancient Volgirard cemetery, which was made of land which had formerly belonged to the community. On Fridays, the nuns hear high mass, vespers, and all the offices as on Sunday. They scrupulously observe in addition to all the little festivals unknown to people of the world, of which the Church of France was so prodigal in the olden days, and of which it is still prodigal in Spain and Italy. Their stations in the chapel are interminable. As for the number and duration of their prayers, we can convey no better idea of them than by quoting the ingenuous remark of one of them. The prayers of the postulants are frightful, the prayers of the novices are still worse, and the prayers of the professed nuns are still worse. Once a week the chapter assembles. The prioress presides, the vocal mothers assist. Each sister kneels in turn on the stones, and confesses aloud, in the presence of all, the faults and sins which she has committed during the week. The vocal mothers consult after each confession, and inflict the penance aloud. Besides this confession in a loud tone, for which all faults in the least serious are reserved, they have for their venial offenses what they call the coup. To make one's coup means to prostrate oneself flat on one's face during the office in front of the prioress, until the latter, who is never called anything but our mother, notifies the culprit by a slight tap of her foot against the wood of her stall that she can rise. The coup or pechavi is made for a very small matter, a broken glass, a torn veil, an involuntary delay of a few seconds at an office a false note in church, etc. This suffices and the coup is made. The coup is entirely spontaneous. It is the culpable person herself, the word is etymologically in its place here, who judges herself and inflicts it on herself. On festival days and Sundays, four mother presenters intone the offices before a large reading desk with four places one day one of the mother presenters intoned a psalm beginning with Ecce, and instead of Ecce she uttered aloud the three notes Do Si Sol. For this piece of absent-mindedness she underwent a coup which lasted during the whole service. What rendered the fall enormous was the fact that the chapter had laughed. When a nun is summoned to the parlor, even were it the prioress herself, she drops her veil, as will be remembered, so that only her mouth is visible. The prioress alone can hold communication with strangers. The others can only see their immediate family, and that very rarely. If, by chance, an outsider presents herself to see a nun, or one whom she has known and loved in the outer world, a regular series of negotiations is required. If it is a woman, the authorization may sometimes be granted. The nun comes, and they talk to her through the shutters, which are opened only for a mother or sister. It is unnecessary to say that permission is always refused to men. Such is the rule of St. Benoit, aggravated by Martin Verga. These nuns are not gay, rosy, and fresh, as the daughters of other orders often are. They are pale and grave. Between 1825 and 1830, three of them went mad. End of Book 6, Chapter 2